This is Control Structure, episode 157, for September 18th, 2019. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs157 to see them. I am one of your hosts, Andrew Bailey, and with me today, the other host, Stephen Orvist. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Steve. So, yeah... I'm not sure if that title read is getting boring. We always read the same thing. That's because you copy and paste it. I don't really paste it. I just copy the document in the folder. You know, just I have an actual template file that I copy for one of our episodes. So You're copying your pasting. Something like that. D- leave me alone. Let's we'll see if we can add some excitement. <laughs> Like raspberry? raspberry? Raspberry! Raspberries! Raspberries? Yes. What is better than one raspberry pie, but 1,060 raspberry pies? That should be 1,060 times the fun. Exactly. That's what Oracle thought, so they built a supercomputer computer out of 1,060 raspberry pies. Wait, wait, pies. hold on, hold on. I gotta stop you there. I don't think Oracle is is my definition of fun. They make databases. They make a whole operating system just for their database. Even though it's based on Linux. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's... They think they're special. Yeah, that's essentially what passes for a new operating system these days. <laughs> but, okay, go <laughs> on. Get a kernel, pop it in, <laughs> put some eye candy on. <laughs> Look at me, I made a whole operating system. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, good for them. They made a Raspberry Pi supercomputer. Yes, and apparently the... It's uh, more like a prototype one that's not actually useful in a, a good way, other than uh, some employee said that it was cool to do. So it was actually a fun project. That yeah, they I did. don't, I don't blame them saying it was cool to do. Yeah, that that's the excuse for a lot of things, especially, especially what Google's done. It's a good excuse, and they have like three D printed parts to to put the pies together, and it looks very nice. Yeah. And it looks like it was like at some kind of convention. It does. I was pondering what all the stations behind it were. It looks like to arcade out machines. What it was. Yeah. So like, I like. It seems it. a little out of place. I don't know. Uh, but hey, you know, if it was cool, okay. I guess it goes in a some kind of gaming convention. So uh, I kind of chuckled here because when you have a whole bunch of, at least when you have a Raspberry Pi, you don't really think about having SFP gig- 10 gigabit Ethernet, but. Because they have so many, they have a few of these Unify uh, 48 switch, 48 port switches that to tie them together, they needed like these 10 gigabit Ethernet links to like connect them all together. And plus, there's a Xeon server in there to handle like storage of everything, which might be cheating. <laughs> like, but I don't know. Those Raspberry Pis might be faster than it anyway. Only for heavily threaded workloads. So, have you, uh, let's see, one of my first programming books I got was about 3D terrain programming, like graphics programming. So, uh, when I came across this article from, I believe it was in, was, uh, yeah, Mapbox, one of the engineers, uh, at Mapbox, uh, did a, posted a, you know, some kind of explanation of how the real-time right triangulated irregular networks, which is essentially an algorithm that if you take like a, how should I say this, like a scan of uh, like a certain amount of ground, like you have like this grid of points, uh, but those are just points. You need to like connect them into triangles. But if you connect every point into a triangle, that's going to be like a lot of triangle. They'll be a little slow to render. So uh, in order to make that a little bit faster, you can selectively take out triangles that really don't matter much. So this RTIN algorithm uh, essentially takes those triangles out if like the uh, variance like is within a certain limit. How should I say? So like for flat areas, it doesn't put too many triangles, but for say like mountains and cliffs, it puts more triangles in there because like if you have one triangle and there's supposed to be a mountain there, well, that's going to look a little weird now, isn't it? So, yeah, this is like mountain in New Zealand here. They have in this uh, post here, they have this nice little demonstration with a little slider that uh, you can use to say, like, for areas of the ground that are like within 100 meters of each other, you know, like you can only do like that course. But if you say like maybe five meters, you get this nice, 
detailed mesh here that looks pretty cool. And you can even scroll down and see the triangles being built. And you can see like the algorithm, you know, sort of like going recursively through all these. Mm. And I thought it was pretty cool. It's cool how it subdivides it into triangles and then just breaks it down in it. So, um, have you ever needed to get a, get support from someone at Google? I do not think I've ever... Well, I have posted before, but I think it was more some bug on the forums. And I believe it was like not a Google print like that. So, I'm, I'm not sure... Probably I've interacted with them uh, for uh, like Google Tag Manager, which is something that uh, e-commerce clients want on their websites. Uh, so Nathan Haig, the founder of a survey builder company, uh, took a was just kind of frustrated that he could not uh, get a certain limit increased on his uh, GTM account. Uh, because he apparently submitted like six requests to increase this limit. Uh, it doesn't exactly say over how long a time period, uh, but like these apparently weren't going anywhere for him. Uh, so he decided instead to take out some Google ads and target them to uh, Google employees, you know, trying to you know get their attention. Uh, hey, I'm trying to get this increased. Will you please help me out? So uh, apparently with this. It didn't seem to work, but uh, he went on to Hacker News and got some attention of people working there, you know, saying, hey, I work at Google, I can try to see if I can work on this for you. Uh, and he actually said that he got it uh, fixed. Yeah, update, thing fixed. Media release, and some of you helped bigly huge with getting Google to huh. sort it out. So he didn't need the ad after all. <laughs> Of course, it, though, maybe the articles and things helped him show up on Hacker News instead of just being a random guy. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, like, one of his first comments was, like, I can't believe this is on here. So, which, I mean, it's not exactly news, but I thought it was pretty funny. Uh-huh. So, uh, do you miss Encarta? I do remember way back when, before the days of unfettered, much megabytes of internet using Encarta and, and watching various videos in it and even playing a fun little game in it. Yes. So the first computer that the family had came with like a, a whole bunch of bundled software and with it was uh, Encarta 95. Uh, so, you know, I kind of like that, uh, you know, clicking around there. It's like, oh, you know, this, uh, it was kind of like an offline version of Wikipedia like in a browser, like, because there is, like, links all around everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so in lieu of a uh, geography class, which apparently my school did not, uh, how should I say, did not provide, instead I pretty much went around and, like, bookmarked all the countries. Like, like every uh, article about a country, like, I bookmarked and just, like, would read them. Uh, apparently, like, exotic places fascinated me as like uh, an eight-year-old. So, uh, and then like you were saying there about uh, that little game in there, uh, Mind Maze, that was pretty cool. So like, it's essentially like a maze, but it pretends like you're going through a castle and like you have to, it's kind of like a version of Jeopardy, except that instead of getting money, you advance to another room. And you know, occasionally you would like go off on a dead end branch, but like there was like these torches that you could light and they were they would like pretty much review view reveal sorry reveal the entire maze for like 10 seconds so like you get a picture of okay i go over there over there and then up or whatever uh Apparently I was too young to remember, or back then to think to do the screenshot of the torches. Now I'm like, why did I not do that? I was so dumb then. <laughs> I don't think I did, but apparently I have a photographic memory that lasted long enough to <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> Me, I had to burn my torches up. But, uh, like, it depends on, like, which, how should I say, like, how high your score was that advanced you to the last level or something so like even if you did go on a dead end branch hey you got points from it so uh like in the past couple years i've been wondering if there's been anything like that because the last version of encarta was released in like 2009 uh so like if there's like some kind of web version of mind maze i would probably look into it 
So, but yeah, if anyone knows that, I'd be, uh, I'd be happy. I'd be game for it. Ha. Yes. So, uh, we've talked about the power architecture a few, uh, a little bit on this podcast. Uh, it's essentially IBM's, uh, mainframes. Like, it powers IBM's mainframes. Uh, so it's kind of like this big, uh, power-sucking, you know, system that, uh, like, even if, uh, like, it got consumerized, you probably would not see it in cell phones, but if you're, like, processing a lot of data, it might be useful. Uh, so, I think it was a few years ago we talked about, like, the Open Power Foundation, uh, but, uh, apparently they're, they might be trying this thing again by actually opening the instruction set, so, uh, and, like, maybe even some designs, uh, so, like, if you're this, uh, I should say design chip designer that like wants to you know experiment or something like you can actually like build one of the without having to sign like a 10 million dollar contract for like all this intellectual property i mean it's worth a shot you know like uh was it the those talos systems uh i think we mentioned those a couple months ago that they're essentially like workstation class computers that you can toy toy around with so i mean this might be a thing now. Interesting if people, enough smart people start thinking we're more restricted to come. Uh, what is a thing is XFAT, the uh, extended uh, file allocation table file system that you typically find in SD cards greater than 32 gigabytes uh, and probably flash drives as well. So, uh, like, you know, like FAT32, mm -hmm. it's like essentially like on flash like removable flash storage. Uh, XFAT is essentially like an extension of that. Uh, and despite it being around for like maybe 10 years, Microsoft has finally gotten around to releasing all the specs for it and also uh, adding it to the Open Invention Network so they won't sue anybody that, say, integrates it into the Linux kernel, which at this point they might actually do that themselves. Which would be pretty nice if they do it. Uh, but, I mean, at this point, there's already, you know, like, drivers for it anyway uh, that are included with, say, Ubuntu, but because the Free Software Foundation has a stick up its butt against stuff like this, doesn't exactly want it to be included in the kernel. Speaking of the Free Software Foundation, uh, remember our good old buddy uh, Richard Stallman? It's the one, the, the foundation to uh, be able to do the... I always said you can make that. I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was like this homeschool kid that's reading stuff and like acronyms, I just like, read them. So many things, I'm like, <laughs> totally not the way other people say it. I'm like, oh, well. I mean, at this point, they're kind of like the Taliban of open source, especially uh, Stallman, mm -hmm. especially. Uh, so, like, I don't, ex uh, I don't exactly, uh, you know, blame me for that. Uh, like, there's this quote of him from, like, I don't know, from, like, 95 or something that uh, says, no, you shouldn't call it Linux, you, you should call it GNU slash Linux. Or, as I have recently taken to calling it, GNU plus Linux. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyways... Uh, he recently appeared at Microsoft to give a talk about uh, some, uh, let's say, the normal talking points. Uh, so he gave a mostly standard talk covering the importance of free software, GPL version 3, GNU versus Linux, and so forth. He had, a, he had added a, uh, a list of small requests, make GitHub push users to better software license hygiene. Uh, make hardware manufacturers publish their hardware specs and make it easier to work around secure boot. Just sounds funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, coming from a guy who looks like an old hippie. <laughs> 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 Which there is a video of him, like, picking something off his foot and then apparently eating it. Ew. <laughs> but, uh, anyways, uh, unfortunately we won't have to worry about uh, Stallman too much longer, at least maybe not being in the uh, light so often because he has resigned the as the president of the Free Software Foundation and board of directors he has resigned completely uh, which you know you mentioned that was kind of suspicious that he made an appearance at Microsoft not two weeks before I know it's just like Microsoft and boom he resigns I think you know something's going on there yeah uh, 
that let's let's go let's think about that <laughs> so uh the mozilla developer network uh, uh how often do you use that i don't use it a ton typically if i'm using it checking on some sort of security thing that happened when pen testing found <laughs> like what does this header do <laughs> i'm looking to see about the header stuff that's typically hey, it's a good resource for that uh so there's uh like the mozilla developer network has uh these tables at the bottom of like all their articles um let me go ahead and pull one up here with my handy duck duck go uh search bang that's at the bottom of pretty much all their articles that have browser compatibility for like all their web article that shows uh what you know which browsers support whatever you're looking at uh, there is another website called can i use which is pretty much the same thing uh it well when i say same thing it just does the compatibility tables for yeah. everything i think we've talked about it on the show so you know it does like all these nice compatibility tables here and like has notes and everything and like previous versions of browser uh which is pretty cool and what would even be cooler is that if they joined forces which is exactly what they're doing uh so you know essentially it's just just that they've uh announced that uh pretty much earlier this month about a week ago actually so yeah they're essentially you know did this and say hey if you know of, if you're willing to contribute go ahead so when uh like all, it was a few years ago when all these companies said give us your phone number so we can send you sms text messages with like these uh authentication codes so like uh, if someone steals your password, they shouldn't be able to, uh, like, break into your account because we'll send you a code which you'll need to log in with. Sounds good. Sign me up. Uh, which is a pretty good idea, except that it has a huge flaw, uh, which is your phone company. Uh, so Jack Dorsey, which you may remember from being the CEO of Twitter, uh, has had a, sw a SIM swap attack uh, done against him. So apparently someone convinced, I think it was T-Mobile or maybe AT&T, uh, to switch his number to an attacker's phone number. Uh, and from that, uh, the attacker was able to break into uh, his Twitter account. So with this, I'm pretty sure he's kind of mad about it. Mm. It's starting to get enough publicity that they change because it's going to be put on them. But it's you just hear this happening. People so, makes you not want to trust authentication that the artist because you can do it. Just call them up. But hey, I need my, you know I lost my phone in the toilet. Dog ate it. <laughs> could you could you swap me to my new phone, please? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I've heard of this happening against AT and T specifically. I'm not sure about Verizon. I uh, I haven't heard of this attack uh, happening against Verizon customers, uh, which. Uh, if you were listening to the fringe, heard me say, "Oh yeah, like I paid my Verizon bill automatic," um, which uh, this should have two effects. You know, since it affected the CEO of a very major social network company, that uh, start to move there, but also probably more so on the phone companies to train their people better. But the one problem with the article is that they have uh, bribery. People are bribing that change. Yeah. Uh, that one's hard to fight. I wasn't even... I, it never would have crossed my mind that bribery would have gone phone reps like that. Because most of the time they say, you know, your call may be recorded for quality assurance purposes. Yeah. So br how would bribery work? I would think people would log essentially. At least for keywords, like, hey, what if I give you some money? Can you fix this? Well, it would happen offline, I guess. Like... That would the attacker have would have to know someone on the inside, yeah. uh, which I'm not sure if these companies outsource their customer support. That's true. That could make an impact. Yeah. Uh, think it might not be in this article, but I remember another similar article saying, you know, like if you outsource your customer support, like that's how one way they could get in. Um, it might not have been against this, but I think it was AT, some kind of AT&T uh, like insider that... Uh, like essentially installed like malware on all these phones recently. So yeah, be careful. So I'm not sure if it was the last episode, maybe the last, maybe the episode before that, I talked about the AV1 image format, about how it's gonna come and come into our browsers and save the world all this bandwidth. Uh, there 
apparently has been a competitor appearing on the scene. Uh, so uh, if you remember uh, JPEG, uh, you know, the essentially the group behind the ubiquitous image format uh, has uh, essentially done a call for, uh, uh, was it like a call for suggestions or proposals or whatever uh, out to the world. And they got back seven proposals, one of them from Google, another one from Cloudinary, which is apparently a platform for video and uh, image distribution, kind of like a CDN, I think. Um, so they came up with an image format that has some pretty cool properties. So, uh, like, so like for web, web pages, uh, occasionally you'll see like a very blurry image at first and then like it'll fill in the details later and like maybe even further because like phones these days have like so many pixels on them. Uh, so with that, you know, wouldn't it just be easier just to have one file that you could like stream out? to web browsers and say like the first kilobyte is the really blurry one the first say 80 kilobytes is the pretty decent one for like most uh most devices and bandwidths and then like the really like send it all for like a really big version or whatever it could allow less code too because the browser possibly so uh, jpeg xl uh, is the name of this new format that you can essentially like stream out to uh to web browsers uh, it has support for, you know, like 10 and 12 bit uh, image depths. It, I think it said it had a transparency as well. Uh, and it's also uh, kind of backwards compatible with JPEG, sort of. Like you can't exactly shove this file into like a normal JPEG decoder and expect it to work. But the encoder can take a normal JPEG and extract out the, uh, I think it's called the coefficients like the actual data inside that's compressed. So it doesn't have to decompress it and then recompress it into some other format. It can just like look at the raw data from the file and like squeeze it down a little bit more. And it can take the file that's squeezed down and convert it back into JPEG to, you know, for browsers that may not support JPEG XL. Um, and of course it's like specifically an image format instead of being a format plucked from a video format uh, like a fr still frame from a video, so it's not going to be like all smeary and blurry like a video. Because uh -huh. you you mentioned that, and you know I've seen it too. Just right. like go onto any random YouTube video and just pause it, and it's like ooh. Wow, it was clear a moment ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's clear in motion. Yes. Uh. So and of course it has like a variable. Uh. How should I say? Like with MP3s and stuff, you have a variable bit rate in that uh, the areas that need more data dedicated to them will get more data dedicated so to them. the variable bit rate in this format or did JPEG have? I don't think so. Oh, wait, the bullet point right there says, yeah. answers my question, same quality in every region. Yeah, although, I mean, you could, I think, uh, I think Moz JPEG, like, uh, sort of, like, nudged in that direction. Okay. But, uh, uh, let's see... There is one series of videos that I'm, I guess I'll put in to the show notes that explains like in fair amount of detail how JPEG works and like all the, uh, like how it breaks down into these mega blocks and then compresses them. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm, you know, granted I've converted a few things to AV1, that image format. Uh, and that looks pretty good, and I don't see why AV1, uh, or rather AVIF, will be, uh, supported in browsers, because it's backed by all the major browser vendors, uh, so I'm not exactly sure who else would be pushing JPEG XL, aside from Google and Cloudinary, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll be keeping an eye on this. So, let's step away from image formats for a moment and go to music formats. Especially hipster music. Uh, when was the last time you played a vinyl record? That would go back quite a few years when I actually played. Like, I'd probably be under to guess. Okay. So, probably like 20 years ago? Something like that. Yeah, about the same for me. Uh, but hipsters have essentially, like, are starving for vinyl. Uh, so much so that vinyl is set to, uh, this year, set to outpace CD sales. Apparently no, one's, 
Apparently no one's buying CDs anymore. So I just had a random thought. So vinyl is really just bad. Sort of. I 3D print that. Possibly if you have enough fidelity. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I just, like, as we're talking, it just, like, popped in my head that you could 3D print, maybe. Possibly, although, uh, yeah. like, the way a vinyl record is made is that, you know, you have this... I'm not sure exactly what the material is made out of in the mastering studio, but it's essentially a lathe Yeah. that, you know, pushes down into this, uh, like, I guess you would, might be vinyl, and then, like, literally, like, vibrates this lathe uh -huh. around, and then, like, it essentially does, like, a, like, a negative of that in, like, some kind of metal, and then that's what's used to press down. Oh, because they're the stamped, disc. actually. Yeah, yeah. So, um... Any bets on when CD will be uh, the hipster's music format of choice? Uh, I'm guessing sometime around 2040. It'll happen eventually. Yeah. So, uh, if you have feedback for the show, go ahead and submit it on Reddit uh, or on the Nexus.tv uh, next to our pretty faces. Uh, and don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so I'm serious about this. Back up your CDs. Like, generally I do this as some kind of joke, but seriously, back up your CDs. Like... Bit rot is a thing, uh, and you don't want to, you know, have your CDs rot like you did the floppy disks. Not exactly you particularly, but like in general. Uh, so yeah, that seems to be about it. So hey, maybe next time uh, I will prepare a little bit more, and maybe we can put the Ethernet cable in my walls. There you go. So I'm still not exactly sure of how to drop it down from the attic. So. I might need to buy my own ladder for that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, let's see. I guess I might be finishing Psychonauts soon. Uh, it's a game that I've been playing on and off for at least five years. Um, so, and I've, like, restarted it now, like, twice. Uh, like, this is, like, sort of my, my third playthrough, and I think I might finally be getting to the end. Then you can go. Five years? Yes. That has been in my playing list for a very long time. So, how about you? Well, let's see here. So we had pigs this last, I suppose, I've been growing to work on putting up a giant fizzy nest. Uh, is there any kind of hunting season? Oh, there's always the hunting season. <laughs> Currently, uh, right now, there's the red tags in uh, for deer, and I found a farmer nearby me has red tags. Has a deer problem, and I was like, oh, great. So, so I went to plug in my freezer last night and just see if it were things. We got it. Currently, it doesn't. It runs, but it doesn't make things. So I need to make the freezer working so that after I shoot it, I can quarter it and throw it. Kind of like, uh, kind of the opposite of my broken microwave. It'll go, it'll run, it'll make noise, but it won't make it hot. <laughs> yes, the opposite <laughs> of your broken microwave. That's exactly. Yeah, like I plugged it in. I heard and it kind of like made a funny sound. Then it kind of you hear the compressor kick on. I'm like, this is good. It's running. And I come back, I'm like, it's warm, and I keep coming back, it's warm, it's like overnight, it's still warm, and I'm like, I don't think it's working. So, what's red tags? Uh, it looks kind of like a zip tie. Uh, the Game Commission gives them to farmers who have deer damage, and it's outside of the normal hunting season, so uh -huh. it actually ends in so it'll be ending here, if it hasn't already ended really soon. But when you go to tag the deer, you just take the, the plastic thing and it goes into itself and it becomes good tie to, to hold on. This is different versus the normal tags if you use, they're like paper. You have to tie them to the ear somehow. Hmm. So just a different way of doing it. So, in other words, animal control. Yes, because they're eating all the corn and soybeans. Yeah, so... Okay, well, hey, you learn something new every day. Yep. So, alright, uh, so have a good one. You too.